Okay. okay, thank you. Well, Cyclone Yassi, thankfully, is now a low-pressure system uh, close to the Northern Territory border. Uh, there are still some residual issues in the area in terms of rain bands and storm activity, uh, but thankfully uh, we're glad to see the end of it. Uh, I can confirm, unfortunately, uh, the death of a young man uh, south of Ingham. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, young person involved, uh, it appears, and I just do stress that the coroner will, of course, uh, determine the cause of death, but it appears that this young man uh, was using a generator uh, in an enclosed environment. Uh, our condolences, of course, uh, go to his family and friends, but again, it's just timely for us to provide a very clear safety message to the many people throughout the region, particularly those uh, highly impacted areas where power problems still exist, uh, that the use of generators needs to be undertaken in a safe manner. And simply that means plenty of ventilation and open spaces. Uh, this is a tragic uh, loss of life, uh, and again, our condolences extend uh, to that young man's family and friends. Uh, we do understand uh, that many people in the highly impacted areas in particular uh, are getting anxious about uh, the levels of support uh, and contact that they're able to have uh, with emergency authorities. Uh, we just ask them to be patient, but we reassure them, uh, particularly from today, there are large teams of people in the area and moving into the area today and over the weekend uh, to provide that additional support. There have been significant difficulties in terms of access. Uh, roads are cut uh, in a large number of areas. There's heavily uh, debris on uh, many, many of the main access roads, uh, but we are slowly getting people in, and from today they will see large teams of people uh, in the area. And to give an example uh, of uh, the resources which will be deployed, uh, between Cairns and Townsville there will be 150 plus extra police on top of existing resources uh, deployed particularly to those highly impacted areas. As we've already indicated, uh, around 500 SES between now and next Wednesday will be deployed again into those highly impacted areas, the Tullys, Cardwells, Mission Beats, etc. On top of that, um, Australian Defence Force, uh, Ergon, uh, Telstra, um, Optus um, are putting in extra people uh, to work on the infrastructure to get uh, essential services uh, back on board. Queensland Fire and Rescue Service have moved their urban search and rescue teams. These are the people that do the rapid damage assessment uh, and are now based in Tully. Uh, and we'll provide some more detail on that. In terms of power supply, which is a significant issue right across the region, uh, Ergon advises uh, that by the weekend they expect to have up to 850 staff uh, working on restoring the network. The normal workforce for that region is around 300. Uh, during Cyclone Lowry, there were around 450 people deployed. So in terms of the uh, Ergon assets, we're talking about twice the number of people uh, that were able to respond to Cyclone Lowry, and around three times the normal workforce will be in the area over the next couple of days working on restoring power. So the simple message and the clear message to those communities, particularly people in the highly impacted areas, is that we understand... Uh, you're anxious, um, but there are large teams of people in the area now and many more will be moving into the area over the next couple of days. Minister, can you just clarify how many people are missing and who is missing where? If I could move on to that issue shortly, I'll get the Deputy Commissioner to make a few comments about that. Uh, there are a couple of other issues I'd just like to give some information about first in terms of power, which is of significant concern. I've talked about uh, the assets that, uh, and people that Ergon will be moving in. PowerLink today, for the first time, uh, will now be able to get aerial assets into the air uh, to inspect their network. And later on today, we hope to have a more accurate assessment about the impact, particularly on the transmission towers, and that will be happening today. In terms of damage assessment uh, generally, um, the, the best uh, form of advice, of course, is uh, on-the-ground people. But uh, what we've been able to do through the Queensland Fire and Rescue Service uh, air operations is to survey... Uh, many of the affected communities. Uh, we will get them today because we're able to get uh, helicopter assets into the air into some of those uh, more difficult communities and I'm talking about places such as Lucinda, Halifax uh, and Forest Beach where we haven't been able to get into previously uh, for assessments. But up to this point, and I do stress these are very preliminary assessments, we know that there are at least 20 homes which have been totally destroyed in the high impact area uh, and around 400 at least uh, with moderate to major damage. 
We expect those numbers to rise um, as more assessments are undertaken, particularly now that we can get uh, more helicopters into the air and more people on the ground uh, to assess communities um, street by street. But I do stress that uh, access uh, is still a problem in a number of areas. Uh, very heavy rain, localised flooding in places like uh, Ingham, uh, Guru, uh, and flash flooding in individual areas. Uh, the Macrossan Bridge currently has around four plus metres across it, uh, restricting access out to Charters Towers. But a lot of work has been done uh, to get people through and particularly to um, get things such as resupply of essential services uh, and uh, food and equipment into areas. Resupply of many of these communities will be a key focus um, um, and has been for some time. I can confirm today uh, that a ship will arrive in Townsville with 2,750 tonnes uh, of essential feed items and, uh, and supplies. Uh, that's equivalent of 110 trucks of equipment, uh, uh, food and equipment uh, and supplies. Uh, we are looking through uh, transport and main roads as well as opening up alternative routes into places such as Tully, and we've had uh, advice uh, later this morning uh, that uh, road access, where it's available up to Mackay, we've now got road access at least through to Tully, uh, and alternative routes are being sought to ensure that we can get uh, those uh, supply operations underway. Uh, the final point uh, I just want to conclude on uh, is to, again, uh, reassure uh, those communities, particularly in the hardest-hit areas, that we understand uh, the difficulties that they are experiencing. We know that power is cut. Uh, we know that communications is difficult. We know that moving around communi uh, those communities is difficult. But uh, there are many people in the areas working on these issues and many more will be seen in the areas over the next couple of days. I might just ask the Deputy Commissioner to say a few words and then we're happy to answer um, uh, any more detailed questions. Thank you, Minister. And uh, in relation to the missing persons, we are still in undertaking inquiries uh, to look for two people, uh, both males, in that uh, Cardwell area. Uh, certainly uh, they will be a focus when we have the resources available to get in there and conduct uh, appropriate searches. Up until that time, we'll be undertaking the necessary inquiries to try and locate them. Um, I can provide that afterwards. And uh, is, this, is one of those people that are missing, is that the gentleman from Porch? Who was down to attend his job. That's correct. Um, so, before we have any more questions, I might just ask Bruce Grady from EMQ to, to say a few words about some of the um, uh, responses from the Department of Community Safety personnel as well. Uh, thanks, Minister. Uh, as I advised yesterday, uh, 50 additional SES personnel uh, were flown into Cairns with a further 140 uh, today and 100 scheduled to go tomorrow. Uh, with more on standby, uh, as the Minister said, there's more than 500 uh, who are already uh, ready to deploy uh, into the area. Um, they do need to be staged. We do need to make sure that uh, when they arrive that we make best use uh, of these people. And that's why yesterday uh, was spent making assessments um, so that we can develop the appropriate strategies to get these people in uh, to start assisting the community uh, as early as possible. Uh, to give some further indications of the scale of the event, um, the 132500 number to the SES has now taken 4,183 calls directly related uh, to this event. Uh, that's resulted in uh, 2,823 tasks and uh, 960 of those tasks relate to people reporting significant damage to their properties. Um, so they will be the focus uh, of these SES uh, crews as they de deploy into the area. Um, you can uh, imagine the sort of work tarpaulins on roofs, uh, getting these properties back into uh, to a livable state. That's our, uh, our priority over the next uh, few days uh, and, uh, and the early weeks of this event. Thank what you. What happens to people whose homes have been completely destroyed? Where do they go? Uh, yeah. um, that was the other point I needed to raise. Uh, the Department of Communities and, and Red Cross, the Salvation Army, Lifeline, all of those um, service agencies uh, are currently operating a number of evacuation centres and they'll continue as required uh, and also uh, opening up uh, recovery centres, particularly in the highly impacted communities. For those people that do require longer term accommodation, uh, the Department of Communities uh, will initially be working with those through the existing evacuation centres to identify appropriate uh, um, properties uh, and housing uh, for them to, uh, uh, to move into for the longer term. So that's an issue which is currently being worked on and will continue to be resolved in the coming days. In terms of the people who are missing, who, who's reported them missing? 
Um, in relation to uh, the, uh, there is one male uh, who has been reported by his sister and she lives in uh, Brisbane. Um, there is another person who was talking to a friend overseas. This is the gentleman on the boat. And uh, that report has come from the overseas contact, as I understand. The first man you mentioned, is it the same one yesterday that you thought was missing? Then? No, totally different. Uh, we did uh, locate a gentleman yesterday, uh, but we've gone back up to two uh, cases today. And, and this is totally different in terms of profile from, from the flood events that we had just recently. We think that's mainly because that immediate, the people were with their friends and loved ones at the time of the, uh, at the cyclone passed. And so everyone knows that they're OK, that they've got through this in, in the main. And there was also a window of opportunity after um, Yasi passed that there were good communications still available to people. What's happened now is those communications have failed, not because of, uh, only because of destruction of phone towers uh, and other infrastructure, but because now battery backup is starting to wane on those types of things. So people just can't locate their friends. The Western uh, route that it took, Richmond, Julia, Creek and now into Mount Isa, all OK in those places? Uh, yes, uh, th at this morning's teleconference we had uh, the mayors and uh, district disaster coordinators from each of those districts and whereas there have been reports of trees down and, and, and minor impacts in, in various properties, um, basically the impact has been negligible. Um, so again, uh, we just really do thank uh, those communities in that, uh, those regions which have felt the impact overnight uh, for cooperating with their local disaster and district disaster groups and thankfully uh, Yasi has now... Uh, uh, reduced to a low pressure system, um, still leaving a bit of rain, particularly up in the Gulf area. Uh, so there are some issues up there in terms of flooding uh, that might develop over the next few days. Uh, but thankfully, um, as it approached towards Julia Creek, Mount Isa, uh, it weakened and uh, we haven't had any reports of any significant damage. Have you, uh, which uh, communities have you not been able to get into at this stage? Well, many of these communities already do have uh, police, emergency services personnel in them with the local residents. It's been a difficulty in accessing those um, communities by road uh, with heavy equipment, etc. But uh, as I've indicated earlier, the areas where we want to do some areas of aerial surveillance today are Halifax, Lucinda area, uh, some of those smaller communities, and we'll get the uh, air assets into the air today and this morning. Uh, we will get a better picture of the damage uh, in those particular locations. So is it damage you're looking for there, or missing people as well, possibly? Well, it's predominantly damage. Obviously, um, there is st still some communication and uh, intermittent communication into some of these areas. Um, and as the Deputy Commissioner has indicated, we've only had those two uh, reports of missing persons at this stage. So predominantly the focus is on getting an assessment of the damage. Uh, there's going to be a lot of rebuilding work in a lot of communities. Uh, and we need to get uh, as accurate as possible an assessment of the damage. Um, and if we can do that by air initially, um, ultimately it needs to be house by house, building by building. Uh, we know, for example, in places like Tully, it's not just the significant number of residential properties that have been damaged in the CBD, uh, there is significant damage to commercial and industrial properties as well. Uh, all all of those assessments will take time. Will you have to fly supplies into those communities? Um, well, we're looking at all options in terms of resupply. That's a key focus of the disaster groups locally and at the state level. Uh, resupply of communities is an absolutely essential uh, role that uh, is uh, being undertaken and whether it needs to be flown in uh, by truck, ultimately uh, we need uh, hopefully to get the rail lines open as well. Whatever means is available, uh, we'll be using that to get uh, resupply of essential items and foodstuffs into those communities. Minister, do you think the state needs disaster insurance? Well, look, that's an issue which I've, I've heard is raised. I mean, we have a, a very significant um, a cooperative arrangement with the federal government under the Natural Disaster Relief and Recovery Arrangement. Uh, it's been long-standing. Uh, it works well. What that system means is that uh, when a particular trigger point is, a, is um, reached in terms of damage, uh, both the state and the Commonwealth contribute towards... Uh, the costs of restoration. It's worked well in Queensland and I expect it to work well into the future. But if, if an ordinary citizen has to have insurance to protect their property, why shouldn't a state government have insurance to protect public property? Well, these are questions which ultimately are not uh, the responsibility of the emergency services and police minister. My major focus is an operational response, uh, so some of those questions should be directed to others. But I will say... Uh, that uh, we do have very robust arrangements already in place, agreements with the Commonwealth Government about what we do to restore public assets, whether that be state government assets uh, or council assets. And that system has worked well cooperatively 
uh, with the Commonwealth for many, many years, and we expect it to work well into the future. Just in terms of the ship off town, for when did you say that was going to arrive? Uh, that ship is expected to arrive today. I don't have a precise time. That will, of course, um, be determined by tides. But again, 2,750 tonnes of essential feed items uh, and supplies, uh, which is good news for that community. But I just stress again. Uh, that a lot of work has been undertaken to look at alternative routes to get uh, road access into uh, many of these communities uh, and that uh, work is underway and the trucks are starting to move as we speak. And Ian, um, in terms of uh, police or policing in the affected areas, has there been any arrests of, of people? Um, we've, uh, in the last couple of days we've had about 11 cases uh, that could be analogous to uh, looting offences, but um, some of those have been opportunistic, like the break and enter of a pharmacy um, on Wednesday night in Cairns at the height of the, <laughs> the crossing of Yahtzee. Um, and I think that that might give an indication of the mentality of the people involved. But uh, certainly, uh, it's only 11 at this time since, yeah, so this, since Yahtzee's event started. And you say, so how many of those 11 cases are attributed to looting, do you think? No, the 11 are are similar or actual looting offences. So that's, that's a bit shabby, isn't it? It's, I think it's a disgrace. Um, and it really is a disgrace that people would even consider doing this sort of thing at, at a time when the trauma being suffered by our community is so great. Ian, yeah, where, where were those offences? Uh, I don't have... A, thank or? you. Um, I know the one in Cairns. There was one in Cairns on Wednesday night. Um, the other details I can get to you after. And they've been... Charged or arrested? Where is that sort of process at? Uh, no, I can't say they've all been charged, but there have been 11 cases. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Thank you.